Good morning, everyone. Let's remember the Lamb of God that we were just singing about. And so this morning, as preparation uh, for the remembrance of, again, the Lamb of God, the Lord's Supper, uh, I want to show you a painting. So I can get it up here. And this isn't just any painting, though. This is a, this is a big one. Okay. Show of hands. Anybody know what this painting is? All right. So David Haley and I are the, are the biggest nerds in the room, for sure. Uh, okay. So this is Michelangelo's The Last Judgment. The Last Judgment. Uh, it was painted by the famous... Uh, Renaissance man, the masterpiece, uh, the master Michelangelo. It covers the whole wall, the altar wall, really, of the Sistine Chapel. It's, it's a huge, huge thing. Uh, the Sistine Chapel, uh, of course, in Vatican City, in, important, big part of the, of the Catholic faith. Um, so this, this fresco, this painting, was started in 1536. Uh, it took four years to complete. Now, if you remember, Michelangelo is famous for painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, and so he finished the ceiling about 25 years before he painted this, uh, or this one, I should say. It's huge. So it's 40 feet by 45 feet. So yeah, we're, we're, yeah, there's nothing small um, about it. Immediately after it was finished, it was, uh, it it was extremely controversial, even in the 1500s specifically. For example, this was a commission uh, by the Catholic Church uh, for Michelangelo to do, and specifically the Pope in those days. Um, and yet Michelangelo included figures and plot lines in this painting from ancient Greek mythology. So a little, little bit different, a little bit different. And, and so there are many different nuances about this work that we could talk about, uh, or as Jamie reminded me last night, that I could talk about and everybody could go to sleep through. Um, uh, but anyway... Uh, it's a very um, interesting uh, piece of art. And on the left side of this fresco, you can see the, um, uh, the saved are ascending into heaven. Um, and on the right side, the, um, uh, the damned are, are descending um, into hell. And so it's a very famous um, piece of art in history. So, so famous, in fact, 25,000 people a day, roughly, go through the Sistine Chapel um, to view all of its uh, artwork. So on a personal note, so Jamie and I have gone there uh, uh, a couple times now. Um, maybe many of you have as well. Maybe you had a similar experience as us. The first time we were there, it's extremely overwhelming. Uh, there's art just, just everywhere. Um, however, I, I distinctly remember this. The second time we were there, um, it was really early one morning. I recall, I think it was about like 7 a.m. Um, and it, it wasn't very crowded. We spent uh, a fair amount of time in there. Um, and of all the stuff you could look at in the Sistine Chapel here, uh, for me, I kept coming back to this, this huge, huge fresco at the back wall. Um, to me, it's, it's very interesting and, and I would say moving to a certain degree. And I, I hope you understand, I, I say this from a purely art and history uh, perspective. I remember last year, you remember Daniel um, uh, talked during our studies about having a uh, 2020 biblical view, uh, specifically about art and culture um, that, for me, uh, put things in a, in a really good uh, perspective. But, but again, this is a very interesting artistic masterpiece uh, that people flock to see. However, I don't have an artistic bone in my body. Uh, but I think I've got a better picture of the Lord's return. We have a much better one than that one that was just shown. And honestly, it doesn't even compare. The Apostle Paul, through the direction of the Holy Spirit, specifically tells Christians and gives a glimpse of what the Lord's return is going to look like. What's going to happen? We don't know all the details, but specifically, Paul paints a picture for us of a very, very great day. In 1 Thessalonians, there was um, concern, and we might even call it discouragement, um, at the church in in Thessalonians, or in Thessalonica. Uh, Amongst others, it appears there were two big questions people were concerned with. 
um, questions of concern. One was, what happens if I die before the Lord comes back? And the second question is, okay, what if I'm still living? <laughs> what if I'm still living when the Lord returns? How is all this going to work together? And, you know, I think we would probably agree like the early church did. That can be concerning, can be concerning, maybe even uh, confusing. So what Paul does is he gives some information and encouragement that addresses these two specific um, questions. In fact, he even says as part of his narrative, comfort one another with these words. So, so what does he say? So I, I'm in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Here is the picture that Paul paints through the Holy Spirit. He says, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, concerning those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. Since we believe that Jesus died and rose again in the same way, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep through Jesus. For we say this to you by a revelation from the Lord. We who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly have no advantage over those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a great shout, with the archangel's voice, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are still alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. And then he says, encourage each other with these words. I'm not an artist or anyone special, but I know that's going to be a great day. That is going to be a truly great day. Paul says that he isn't guessing what's going to happen. Um, he doesn't say, hey, this is one possibility of what something might look like. He specifically says, this was through revelation. This is what it's going to look like. He received this information from the Lord. Specifically, the Lord will come. He will descend from heaven. There's going to be a great shout. The voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God will be involved. And then he says, Paul says, I know the dead in Christ are going to rise first. And those who are alive will meet them together in the clouds. Then everyone who lived and who died will be with Christ. We'll meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always then be with the Lord. What's great encouragement. What great encouragement. What powerful words. So again, I don't need an artist. I don't need a masterpiece to show me what's going to happen. The God of heaven has revealed it to us, and it's going to be a great day. So this morning, as we partake of the bread and the fruit of the vine, we remember the Lord. We remember his promises. We remember the, the perfect life, the perfect sacrifice that was given to restore the fellowship between the creator and, of course, the created who broke fellowship through sin. And finally, this morning, we celebrate the anticipation of the Lord's coming. Whether we're living or whether we have died, it's going to be a great day. So let's remember the Lord at this time.